Hello. Thank you for joining us today. We are gonna get started right now. Um, we, I'm, we are so excited to share this information and share this new vision of the program with everyone. If you aren't, haven't already, please mute yourself. Um, this is the FY21 Arts and Education Update pre-launch webinar. My name is Precious Blake. I'm the Arts and Education Program Director and Accessibility Coordinator for the Maryland State Arts Council. We are joined today by Kat Frost, who is our new Arts and Education Grants Management Associate. She will be supporting me and us today with all tech and chat box moderation. So if you have any questions, feel free to just chat her. So as I mentioned, please mute your device until you are speaking. You will need some way to jot notes. We have a lot of information to share with everyone today, but a recording will be shared at a later time. We are gonna hold our webinar to an hour and a half with opportunities for additional follow-up with me or Kat. So let's go over some Google Meet uh, controls. First, the chat box. In the upper right-hand corner of your meeting screen, you will find the tab for the chat box. Chat messages will be displayed for all attendees. So please write any questions or concerns that you have during the presentation in the chat box. Audio and video. So to mute and resume your audio, you can hit the mute button on the bottom left of center. To pause, resume video, hit the video button on the bottom right of center. Raising your hand. So if you've added the Nod Chrome extension, please use the raised hand feature during before you're speaking during the meeting and we'll call on you. Otherwise, just write raised hand in the chat box and Kat will call on you to unmute and speak at the appropriate time. Closed captions. You can turn captions on at the bottom right of your screen. The live captioning will differentiate which attendee is speaking. Please note, we can't guarantee accuracy for the computer-generated closed captioning. Leaving the meeting. So to leave the meeting, you can press the phone icon at the bottom center of your screen. So here's our flow for today. We have a lot to talk about. So we'll start off with how we arrived here. So the arts and education revision process that we went through for the past couple months. We'll do a teaching artist roster review, an arts and education grant review, a sneak peek of the, the new artist registry, which will be incorporated into our new website. We'll have a little bit of time for an open discussion about the marketing of the program. And we really wanna compile um, some really amazing ideas from folks on the call today. And then we'll have a pretty sizable chunk of our time on questions and reflections. So clarifying any um, needs or questions or anything that you have on your mind, okay? So first, the arts and education revision process. So this uh, kicked off in November of 2019. Um, some, some, for some of you folks, you might remember that the arts and education revision process really started in the spring of 2019, but there was really a need to revisit and um, do the process over time in three parts. There's a lot to talk about in regards to equitable access for arts and education and updates to the program so we can best serve teaching artists and teachers and students across the state. So we started with phase one, which was about equitable funding in arts education. Um, our objective was to create an equitable funding formula for arts and education funding for Maryland. Um, a lot of the major concerns that were brought up during this was dis the distribution of funding across the state, especially for rural areas in Western, Southern Maryland and the Eastern Shore. And the formula that we talked about applies to public and private funding or public and private schools, I'd say. 
And we'd also wanted to keep in mind, and we do keep in mind now that there's no perfect formula. You know, there's no universally agreed upon way to measure student access and need. So all of the editors came together to really talk about how we can create a formula that's based on the data that we have, knowing that it can change and it can morph into something that's more accurate when we have more information in the future. The next was uh, talking about our teaching artist roster. So all of you on the call today. So editors, new group of editors uh, convened in January of this year. And our main objective was to clarify and update the teaching artist roster application, its policies as well that include eligibility, the review process and criteria, applicant and current roster requirements as well. We, most of our major points was to make sure that the guidelines and the applications were clear, more expansive and easier for new applicants to navigate. We also wanted to modify and update the current roster requirements so you all have more flexibility in your programming. We also wanted to revise the panel review process so it felt more expansive as well and it was more transparent. And then finally, uh, the last group of editors convened in February of this year to talk about the Arts and Education Grant, formerly known as the Visiting Performers Program and the Arts and Education Program. So our main objective was to clarify and update what this Arts and Education Grant means, i.e. requests for funding. And those policies included eligibility, the matching requirement, review process and criteria, and applicant and awardee requirements. Once again, echoing what I just said, we wanted to make sure that the process for applicants on the organization or school side was that it was clear, it was easier to navigate. Uh, we wanted to address the matching requirement inequity, um, knowing that some folks found that as a barrier to access. We wanted to clarify the criteria, of course, um, for the education grant and update it really to our current times. And for the first time, we wanted to institute a new panel review process for the arts and education grant. And then finally, phase four is all the work that MSAC had to do in order to align all of these um, editor revisions and policies into our programming. So in March, MSAC sought approvals for the arts and education policy recommendations from the Secretary of Commerce, our Program Performance and Evaluation Committee, uh, and also our full counsel, as well as our Attorney General that talked about really the legalese of the application guidelines. And this past month, uh, in April, MSAC implemented those policy recommendations into our uh, internal procedures. So this included creating an internal marketing and outreach plan for the program, developing rubrics, preparing FY21 online applications and guidelines, of course, uh, so we could be ready for launch in May. So before I move on to the details about what this new program looks like, are there any questions about how we arrived here today? Feel free to raise your hand in the chat box or to raise your hand via the Nod Chrome extension. Great, well, well, we'll move on. If anyone has any questions, feel free to use the chat box. So now we're gonna talk about the teaching artist roster, which formerly was the visiting performer roster and artist in residence roster, and they have collapsed into one. So first, you know, the teaching artist roster, this is MSAC's commitment to you. So what we will provide as the partnership that we have with each other. First, of course, co-funded or funding opportunities for applicants to cost share teaching artist fees, which increases and encourages folks to um, book artists that are on the roster. 
We have connections to a statewide network of organizations and um, to nonprofits that provide and lead professional development for teaching artists. We also want to include individualized feedback and evaluation sessions that will help teaching artists strengthen their programming. So for the first time, um, Maryland State Arts Council hired two arts and education consultants, Lenore Blaine Kellner and Lillian Palin, I think they're on the call, and they will serve as our consultants and will also help facilitate evaluation and feedback for our teaching artists as well as heightened visibility through print and online marketing, including our artist directory. So that includes our marketing and outreach plan that we hope to really celebrate everyone who's on the roster and to really elevate your teaching artistry. As well as opportunities to provide reflective feedback. You know, if something's not working or if there's something that's working really well and you want to share with us, you know, the MSAC staff, me, Kat, and of course, um, Lenore and Lillian, we are really an open book and we wanna hear more from you so we can make this program as best as it can be. You know, that's really just to say that MSAC is your champion and supporter. We're here to connect, facilitate, and uplift you. We're here to be your champion and we're here to be your cheerleader. And I also wanna say that, you know, the teaching artist fees are connected to the arts and education grant. So they go hand in hand and they're really two peas in a pod. And so this is your commitment to MSAC. So how are how we're really talking about the teacher artist roster requirements. And so if you're a new artist on the roster, most of you aren't, but new artists on the roster will have to attend a formal orientation with me. They'll have to um, create and consistently maintain uh, their artist registry profile. You all will have to do that. When we launch our new website, there will be a new version of the artist registry. And so we'll encourage you to create new accounts. And when we get to that point in the website build, you'll get more information of, from us about how to fill out your artist profile. Providing proof of personal liability insurance, being in compliance with County Board um, of Education requirements. We heard from editors and we heard from, of course, the teaching artists that it's pretty tough to find out what all the requirements are across counties. And so the Maryland State Department of Education stepped in to support that process. So if you need any support or guidance about what requirements you need by county, please let them know. Um, right now, it's not possible to do a statewide version of these requirements because every county has their own jurisdictions. And so you'll also be responsible for any required documentation and reporting. So, you know, that includes reports, that includes, you know, if you are supporting applications, um, that includes um, any invoices that we might need from you. And you'll get all that information when we go through the process. And a new update, which is something that how this program did have before, is that for each arts and education grant that a roster teaching artist is approved for, MSAC will disperse 50% of the payment at the time of full execution of the grant agreement, and then the 50% will be dispersed at time of final report submission. We realized that this past year, waiting until the final report submission um, wasn't in alignment with how um, teaching artists really financially supported themselves. So we want to make sure that you know, we are giving you guys your payments in time and that we're supporting you in that way. So it'll be a 50-50 disbursement. And then continue with your commitment to MSAC. So you are going to collaborate with site coordinators and site coordinators, we'll get into a little bit more, but site coordinators are basically your point people at the school or at your community setting that wants to book you for a arts and education engagement. And so you will collaborate with them in submitting that application. You also will agree to scheduled periodic site visits by teaching artist evaluators, that's Lenore and Lillian, and they're gonna observe and give feedback about maintaining professional standards. Now, these site visits are not punitive, they're really just there to be a guide and to support you as much as possible. And we will give more information about how the site visits are gonna roll out once we've kind of rolled out this first version of the program. So we're doing a phased approach. 
Also, you know, to thinking about your activity as a teaching artist, we ask that you at least complete one educational engagement in a fiscal year, whether they're funded by us or not, um, to remain listed on the roster. Or schedule a check-in meeting with me so we can talk about, you know, what you've been up to in the past year. This was an amazing suggestion um, by an editor in regards to if teaching artists wanted to take a creative sabbatical or if there were other things that were happening in their lives where maybe they weren't um, doing any educational engagements. So that's something that we wanted to be flexible on. So I just have one slide about the application because most of you guys don't need it. But if you have colleagues, if you have friends who want to be on the roster and you want to let them know what the application process looks like, this is just a very quick rundown. So we have the application in two phases. So the first is the review phase one, the online application through our Smart Simple portal. It will be reviewed monthly, so not every two years but it will be reviewed monthly by the Teaching Artist Roster Panel. And these are the four things that we are looking at in regards to the application. So evidence of experience, training, or professional development in art disciplines, evidence of experience, training, or professional development teaching with populations or communities of your choice. Three, a detailed scope of an educational engagement you wanna offer on the roster, and an artist statement. Now, you'll notice that these are pretty broad, uh, specifically one and two, the evidence of experience. And this really came from us saying we want to look at applications holistically. There is not one professional development that a teaching artist can do that dictates their expertise in one area. We really want to see a complete picture on what the teaching artist is able to accomplish and what they want to um, share on the roster. So we really, in the application, if you wanted to see a draft of it when it um, launches, you certainly can, you'll notice that it's really just an upload. Share whatever you think is the best version of you. And then the detailed scope of educational engagement type really aligns with the Maryland State Department of Education and their creative uh, process and their Maryland State Fine Arts Standards. So the creative process and the state fine arts standards is something we're looking for in this engagement type. And we'll talk about what engagement types are and what they mean when we get into the arts and education grant. And then an artist statement is really, you know, a narrative about who you are, what's your philosophies, and how you include cultural um, access, inclusion, and equity in your work, and how, you know, you are as a teaching artist and what your creative process is in your artistry. So once we do the application through the panel, there will be a site visit. And these site visits can be conducted year round. You don't have to wait. It's just open to when you want to do your site visit. Um, and so it's going to be reviewed by Lenore and Lillian, who are our teaching artist evaluators. And the entire process of the roster will take about four to six months from application submission to notification of acceptance, depending on when the, the site visit is scheduled. We want to make sure that we give um, enough flexibility for teaching artists to know that there's not one time that might be the best time to do a site visit. So if you apply in the spring, but you have a uh, residency that's happening in the fall that really is going to make you shine, you can schedule your site visit in the fall and it won't um, go against you. Or you can do it, you know, in the next three weeks. It's really up to when you want to share, share your stuff. And at the same time, the site visit, you know, the teaching artist evaluators are really there to be a support system for you too. And they are gonna be holistically reviewing your work in real time. Throughout the application process, whether an applicant goes from phase one or phase two, there's opportunities to receive feedback about their application. So if they wanna learn more about why they didn't move to a phase or why they didn't get accepted to the roster, they can just reach out to me and we can have a sit down um, or, you know, we can do a feedback loop with uh, through email and then you're free to submit again at a later time. So that was quite a lot of information and I think I saw some things in the chat box. So does anyone have any comments or questions about this new teaching artist roster?
Yes, we do have a couple of questions that came through the chat box. From Deborah Spice, we have questions about um, MSAC helping find schools for residencies, a general question about moving on in the time of COVID. And then we have some clarifying questions about um, the need for current teaching artists to reapply with this procedure or um, uh, site visits, how that works for current teaching artists as opposed to new teaching artists. Great, so I'll try to answer all of them. You might have to remind me. Um, <laughs> so for the, the last question, current roster teaching artists do not need to reapply to the roster. So the point of the reflective and the evaluation visits is to check in with the teaching artists where they are right now and to provide feedback on where you are. So we can update you to this new version of the program. And so, you know, Folks that are not on the roster won't need to do that because they'll already be in this new process. Um, in regards to MSAC um, supporting, connecting you to residencies, absolutely. So the first part of that is, you know, if a teaching artist applies to the roster and they don't necessarily have something set up uh, for a site visit and they need support in finding a school or finding a community setting, you know, to do their, their work, we can work with you. They, you just have to reach out to us. And in, regards to, and in regards to teaching artists that are already on the roster and connecting them to residencies, that'll be through our marketing plan. Um, and we're hoping that we can celebrate and show the teaching artists so folks are more willing and more excited to book you. So that's a great time to, you know, share to MSAC what ways we can better get your stuff out there so folks know about what you're doing. And did I miss a second question in there? Yes, so there's a general uh, question about how are we moving on um, in the time of COVID with a follow-up question from Eileen about if these teaching artists' experiences will be expanded to include virtual platforms because of COVID's impact in the fall. And then there's another question about um, updating your roster description, which I know will be covered in the artist registry section. Thank you. So yes, so that we'll get into that in the arts and education grant, but absolutely. So we are hoping to support online programming because of COVID. Um, and you know, we're moving ahead in, in that regard. So because applications are being reviewed monthly and there's not one stop gate, you know, if schools or community settings wanna apply right now, knowing that the residency or the performance won't happen until the winter or won't happen until the spring, that's okay. So folks can really be forward thinking in regards to the application. So, you know, schools don't have to apply now knowing that the residency will happen now because we are wary and mindful of the health risk of that. And then considering, uh, continuing the question about virtual platforms, would it be possible for MSAC to create a statement about paying for virtual school visits? Because many schools assume that a virtual visit equals no honorarium. Thank you. So I think the there's two parts to that. One, we want to support teaching artists in their entrepreneurship and in their financial careers. So if you are supporting or you want to create an online program, um, we want to make sure that you know you you put a price to that. <laughs> and that is on your roster, that is on your profile, and that goes through the application process. If a school still can't afford a teaching artist, we'll talk about that a little bit more about um, the matching requirement for schools uh, because the arts and education grant is a matching program, but we do have some really exciting news about ways in which folks can request a, um, a, a consideration of not having to do that match. So yes, and if you want to add new things to your profile that's not already there, because when I talk about the arts and education grant, it's so expansive that there's so many new things that you might want to add. Um, that really goes in a couple of ways. So if you want to add, for example, if you've always done residencies, but maybe you want to do uh, visiting performances, then our teaching artist evaluators would come into play in regards to just 
um, doing an evaluation session, seeing a visiting performance that you've done before, and then from that review process and then observing your work, they'll be able to determine if they're ready to put that on their profile or not. Um, and so once you get the go ahead on this looks great, this gets our approval for you to move forward because our evaluator said so, then you can put it on your profile and you'll be eligible for arts and education grants for that. And can site visit be to non MSAC residencies? So I might need more clarification on that because the site visit, and I'll talk about it more in the arts and education grant, but teaching artists are going to have a plethora of options on what type of engagement or activities that they can offer on the roster that's beyond residencies. So if you, if a new teaching artist that's new to the roster wants to, you know, one of the, the new engagement types is lectures or workshops. Let's do a workshop. Um, you know, if they want to do a workshop, that means that they just apply for it. And we just want to see what a workshop looks like for you in a site visit. So any other questions about it? This is Ariana. Can I ask a verbal question? Of course, yes. Thank you. My fingers were not moving fast. So if we already do, we're already listed um, on the visiting performers and already listed as residencies and someone wants to do the residency but in a workshop like we do workshops right in within the residency so do we need to apply for a workshop format of the residency or for just saying like you know uh, the whole school would like to have one like we recognize that the entire school pre-k through sixth grade instead of doing a sequential residency wants to discover the power of the written word just one workshop so that every kid can get that experience but that's not new um but it might be new in the way that they're like structuring the time and the funding they have i'm so i don't i was curious about what that means sure so because so I think that would still require one of our teaching arts evaluators just to see what a, a workshop looks like. So if you've done this before, because a residency and a workshop are quite different. And on the website, we'll upload a glossary on what these terms mean. But really the whole point of a workshop is just to be a catch-all on things that maybe it's a day-long experience, maybe it's an hour-long experience, maybe it's something that doesn't really fit in a residency or fit in a performance, but it's an amazing experience. So something like you just mentioned, Ariana. Um, so we hope that the teaching artist evaluators can still just take a look at it because you know, a residency is slightly different from a workshop and you might have to make some modifications. And so once again, it's not punitive, it's more of just a check-in and we want them to just have eyes on it and also support you in regards to um, adapting it if you need it. And Elizabeth asked, do we still need to apply six weeks in advance for the artists and residencies? So no. Um, so for the artists and residents, you, the schools or the communities, they can apply at any time. The only caveat to that is that um, at notification of acceptance and approval, the teaching artist, you, might not get your check until six to eight weeks from approval. So that's really where that six to eight weeks comes from. So, you know, if you apply <laughs> a month in advance of a residency and it's happening in a month, just know that you might not get paid until a month or two from, from that. So just be aware of that. Uh, David, whenever you're ready, feel free to unmute and ask your question. You're still on mute, David.
If you scroll towards the bottom, you should be able to see the microphone to click to unmute. There's also um, control D, I believe should unmute you. Okay, that looks better. Do you have me now? Yes, we do. Okay, sorry, I was clicking on the unmute in the people list and it, I guess that doesn't work. Uh, anyway, so uh, I'm David Hildebrand of David and Ginger Hildebrand. Uh, Ginger, my wife is teaching uh, lessons right now in the room behind me via Zoom. Um, I'm presuming that the programs that we presented last Monday and tomorrow morning we will present uh, for schools. These are assembly programs that were booked a year ago. Um, that since we were able to come up with a, a virtual Zoom version that we communicated uh, successfully to the schools and to their students via Zoom, uh, that those performances count toward the uh, contributions that we were assuming would come from you. That's my question, please. Sure. So the Maryland State Arts Council has released all funding for programming, whether they got canceled or whether you um, translated them to an online format. So it doesn't matter either way. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank and you. So, yeah. And in regards to the, I guess, the school match, you know, the school's responsibility, um, if it's considered complete, to you that the residency was completed because it's an online format, they still owe their match. But if the residency was canceled and you weren't able to um, fulfill your obligations, then they won't be responsible for their match because the residency didn't happen and it wasn't complete. Understood. Luckily, we're all in the first category for this year. Great. S signing off. Thanks, David. Thank you. Mark. Uh if evaluators have to see a new unfunded event before we can be accepted for future funded events? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you won't have to go through an online application. You know, we'll, we'll put some procedures in place where you can just request an evaluator to come see your work. Um, and if you need support in regards to it's unfunded, it's just an idea. We haven't done it yet. I need support in order to pilot this program so you can see the potential um, and, you know, at a school. Reach out to me and we can try to connect you with the Maryland State Department of Education or you know, any of our other community partners if it's not in a school setting. So you can pilot your program and then an evaluator can come see it. Alan asks, what is your projection of PTSA funding for teaching artist programs and residencies when competing with many other educational funding needs during COVID-19's economic effects on school and arts related budgets? And then there are two other questions on deck. Sure, so we don't, um control PTSA funding, really, and we don't really have a projection on how schools are going to be able to, to pay for residencies. Um, that's really, you know, something that's through the Maryland State Department of Education. Right now, we know that we will have a budget for our programming that we can support. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about the intricacies of the arts and education grant. But if a school is not able to afford the full amount of the um, educational engagement, and I'm being very intentional about saying educational engagement and not residency, because it's pretty expansive right now, and it doesn't mean just residencies, um, you know, we can support that. We can support things that are beyond residency. So any questions in regards to specifically the teaching artist roster? We're going to have a lot of time to talk about a lot of other questions, but I want to get into the arts and education grant as well. So any questions specifically about the roster and we can hold all others. The second question was asking about evaluation. Sure, want, question, yep. Can you submit a recorded unfunded event for evaluation? Um, to, if it's an online program, then yes, because it's meant to be online. But if it's meant to be experienced live with people, no.
So we'll get into specific educational types if you have questions about that. Um, and, and so we'll hold those. But any questions about requirements for the roster in regards to your obligations and commitments to MSAC before we move on? I have a question. Sure, yeah. Um, this is Spice and hello everyone. I was on the roster for a while for an artist, um, the performing artist, not resident, but I had a hard time finding, um, uh, you know, performances. And so I have, I've, I had to return the money a few times and I'm wondering if I'm still on the roster or do I need to reapply? Maybe that's an individual question. Sure, and and Deborah, we can talk about that in regards to if you're on the roster or not. Based off of previous, you know, policies that don't apply anymore, um, if you're on the roster, you're on the roster, and all that's needed right now is for either you to have completed something or to have a check-in meeting with me. So it sounds like maybe we just need a check-in, and we can talk offline. Great. Thank so you. Thank you. Of course. So let's move on to the arts and education grant and then we'll take another five minute reflective grant after or reflective break after I talk about the IE, um, the AIE grant. And I just want to flag that the questions that have come in, I'm saving and we'll bring back up at the next break. Wonderful. Thank you, Kat. Great. So let's talk about this new arts and education grant, which is a modified version of the Visiting Performer Program and the Artist in Residence Program. So they have collapsed into one. So first, eligibility. So for a school or a community organization to apply for a grant, they have to be one of the following three things. Either a 501c3 with tax exempt status from the IRS, the US um, Internal Revenue Service, and they're incorporated in Maryland. So really this is anyone who's considered a nonprofit. They have to be a unit of government based in Maryland and that unit of government includes schools and it sometimes can include churches as well um, and other parks and recreation, libraries, things like that. Um, anything that's considered a unit of government. And then a member institution in the university system of Maryland. So our state colleges. And then they just have to know that they've completed and documented um, one fiscal year at the date of application submission and knowing that they've had ongoing arts activities. So arts and education grant fund use. So this is, really applies to you all because the fund use is going to be you. And so grant funds may be used for expenses that are directly associated with any engagements. So they're including, but it's not limited to artist payment and stipends, so to you. Uh, any field trip admission costs, so this is new. Uh, consultant fees, any other honoraria, contractual services, of course, transportation. And then for the first time, disposable art materials. And disposable is really important to the sentence because we cannot fund things that depreciate in value. So, you know, things like computers or equipment, um, costumes as well. We, we can't um, fund those things because you can reuse them over time. So anything that's disposable art materials, we can fund. And so this is educational engagement. So through the editor process, we really talked about the breadth of what teaching artists um, really accomplished throughout their career and what they can do. And this is kind of the list of things that is eligible. So instead of just having residencies and just having visiting performances, uh, the arts and education grant can fund field trips. So specifically field trips that are connected to another engagement. That's just the caveat to that one. Lectures. So this is kind of, you know, if someone, if an artist just really wanted to have a conversation, do a presentation at maybe a college or maybe in a school. Out of school time program. So anything that's out of school time, you know, this is the first time we really want to support those community based organizations and those community based programs. Online programs. So thinking about where we are right now in COVID-19, if you have a new brand new online program that you want to add to your um, to your profile, you can do that as well. 
professional development. So this can be professional development for anyone. So if you lead professional development for teachers, if you lead professional development for students, I mean, depending on what it what it looks like, as long as that professional development is connected to another engagement as well. So residencies, so that's kind of long form engagements, visiting performance. So that's really, you know, those assembly programs that we're used to, to talking about. And then workshop is kind of the catch all to all of this. So, you know, if it's something that's just an hour long workshop, if it's a day long workshop, you know, any kind of engagement that doesn't really fit any of the other categories, we say it's a workshop. <laughs> And when I say um, if connected to another engagement, I mean that the school has to apply for both. So they can apply to have a teaching artist do a visiting performance, and then they do a field trip. Or you know, they apply for a teaching artist to do a residency, and they do a field trip. Or they have a teaching artist do you know, a lecture, but they do a professional development workshop with the teachers. And then the arts and education grant also, we wanted to be mindful that there are so many different communities that teaching artists are working with um, in school and out of school. So these are all the different types of populations and communities that we wanna fund and that we are being mindful of funding. So that includes early childhood, of course, all grades pre-K to 12, um, out, out of school time programming and populations, um, veterans and military, so, um, creative aging slash older adults, people experiencing incarceration and reentry, people with disabilities, people from the LGBTQ plus community, people experiencing homelessness, English language learners, educators, and we also know that, hey, maybe there's populations that we haven't yet to reach out to. So if there is another population that a school wants to um, have the funding for, they can just say, please explain. So we really overall hope that these changes and that these expanded programs inspire you and may allow you more room to be flexible in your programming and in your collaboration with site coordinators. Our whole hope is that we put agency and independence on you to say what is best for your practice and what's best for the community and the school in regards to their relationship with you. I'll also say that a lot of these communities are aligned with the Maryland State Department of Education's micro-credentialing program. So if there are communities that you wanna reach out to, but you don't necessarily have any professional development in teaching with those populations, they are a great resource as well. Um, and you know they're not the only resource. So if you find that there's other professional development working with communities that's outside of MSDE, we encourage that too. And so equitable funding. So this is the formula that we've come about in regards to how we're going to be funding uh, anything that's in a, in a school-based setting. Uh, we know that the, we have populations that we will fund outside. We have split our budget in that way. So part of our budget will be based on school-based programming that will have this formula. And then the other part of our program will programming will be for out of school time settings um, or out of school settings in general that will not have a formula. So let's read this. So the arts and education grant funding for youth audiences age 21 and under will be determined for each county based on the following. 20% of the council approved budget base distributed evenly across 24 counties. And then from the 80% remaining, the budget um, will be by the county's percentage of students receiving free and reduced meals, and then 20% of the budget by student population percentage compared to the state. So MSAC, we know that as new reporting and equity measures are created across the state and nationwide, that this formula may need to be updated. And so we know that it's not perfect once again, but you know, this formula is really based on the currently available information that we have, and there's, each one considers those three equity factors. So the first being the, the base of funding. So we believe and we know that every county should have some designated funding to host at least two educational engagements per year. And that's a very low bar. <laughs> so something that's long form like the residency and something that's short form, short form like a performance or a workshop. 
And then the 80% remaining for farm, so free and reduced meals, we use that as an equity measure because it's the most consistent statewide measure for education barriers. So that includes family income, household size, uh, foster children, migrant children, runaway or homeless children, food supplement programs, and temporary cash assistance. Um, and we also know that those numbers also come in about a year or two late. So we know that we're always kind of catching up to those the most current numbers. And then of course, 20% of the budget is by the student population percentage compared to the state, because we realize that, you know, the quantities of resources by each county is partially determined by the number of students that are enrolled in school, both public and private. So this formula will guide, but not be the sole determinant of funding decisions for educational engagements. So just to let you guys know that. And we're trying this out for a year. And if we have to revisit it, we certainly will. And so a matching waiver. So this is the first time that we're doing this. And through the equity formula and through the arts and education editing process, we really realized that, you know, some schools cannot make that 50% match. And it's a barrier to access. A lot of schools don't apply because they know they can't make that money. And so we're instituting a waiver in regards to applicants can request a waiver from the dollar for dollar match and they just have to submit a very, very short request form in their application budget. We're also including in-kind contributions for the first time, up to 25% uh, percent of, the entire, um, of the entire total engagement cost because we don't want the entire thing to be in-kind. Um, but in-kind contributions will only be considered if a form was submitted. And so the match waivers along with the entire application will be reviewed by our arts and education grants panel and will be based on scoring rubrics, which are, will be available online. And I also wanna mention, and I think we might have some county arts agencies on the line now, but the county arts development arts and education funds can be combined with um, Maryland State Arts Council arts and education funds. So county arts agencies may regrant funds from their CAD grant, which is the county arts development grant for arts and education programs in their counties. Their programs are separate and distinct from the arts and education grant. So you have to work with counties on an individual basis. So arts and education grant funds may be used in conjunction with you know, those arts and education funds from county arts agencies. But they the applicants should note any contributions from counties in their submitted budget. So we say that total MSAC funds in regards to county arts development funds may not exceed three fourths of the cost of educational engagements. And so this is kind of the formula. What I mean. So for example, you know, if you um, get funding from the Montgomery County Arts um, Council, um, that means that their funding should be up to a fourth of the entire cost of engagement. And then the grant funding that MSAC will give will be half of it. And then the applicant has to at least give a fourth um, towards the educational engagements. And we say that the total cost of eligible um, educational engagements for a grant is up to $5,000 per applicant. And so because you're gonna be supporting the site coordinator and applying, these are really important things for you to know for the arts and education grant. So first, of course, confirm who your site coordinator is. The site coordinator has to be somebody who is employed by the organization. So this could be a teacher, this could be the principal, this could be the executive director, a manager, a program manager, you know, a, a program coordinator, anyone who is employed by the site. And then of course, you're gonna confirm your availability, your budget, and what exactly, you know, are they asking for in regards to educational engagements? And then this is going to be slightly different but you will start the Smart Simple application on the site coordinator's behalf. So you should um, create your own Smart Simple accounts. Um, because then what's going to happen is that when you begin the application, you're gonna ask MSAC to invite the coordinators to collaboratively edit and submit the application. 
This is replacing the artist code system. Um, we found that there just were some inaccuracies in that system that didn't work for everyone. So hopefully in this way, we're really encouraging collaboration. And, and yes, I think I saw something in the chat. Applications cannot be submitted by board members, trustees, PTA members, volunteers, or anybody who is not employed by the organization. And this is all in our guidelines that we will um, make public. And here's some more before you apply. <laughs> so applicants have to select only one teaching artist per application. So meaning, you know, if this person wants to book David, because <laughs> just because you're on my screen, um, to for do, to do something, they then can't book uh, Spice in the same application. It has to be one per person. But if they want to, you know, have multiple engagements with one teaching artist in one application, that is also okay. For the first time, we're also saying that, you know, each site or each school or each community setting can book two different teaching artists in the same year. So that just means that they apply twice for two different teaching artists. Up to two grant requests per applicant might be awarded or may be awarded in any fiscal year. So you have up to two chances to get two different teaching artists. Um, if an applicant wants to request funds for a field trip or professional development, once again, they have to identify another engagement type in their application. And the reason why we're connecting them is that we realize that field trip and professional development, um, the, the breadth and in-depth engagement isn't as rich, but it's not saying that it's not as important as all the others. So we just want to make sure that it's connected to something that will encourage some more deeper dive learning as much as possible. And then, you know, multiple sites can collaborate with one teaching artist. So, you know, if there are three schools that want to work with David, because you're on my screen again, <laughs> um, they certainly can, and they can all submit um, in that application. What would happen, once again, is that they would, um, in the application, just note if there are any additional sites, but there should be still one site coordinator <laughs> who's going to coordinate with all of the other schools because it helps us so we can know who to be in communication with in regards to the grant. And so now, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about this budget template. So this is going to replace kind of how um, um, our current system e-grant works in regards to having an automatic uh, budget that you can't really <laughs> budge at all. Um, we are asking for everyone to submit and upload their own budget via an Excel spreadsheet, but we are gonna provide a template for everyone to follow. So this is a, a, a version of, of the um, template and we'll go through a couple of its different pieces. So of course, you know, site coordinator, teaching artist and location you'll add, and then you'll put your line item and there's cash and in-kind. So, you know, only submit the in-kind numbers if there is a matching waiver involved. Then you can put your description and notes. So under educational engagement expenses will be fees. So the teaching artist fee and then anything that's miscellaneous. So if you have a consultant or some other contractor, something like that. And then travel. So. You know, you'll include your commute miles if you're using, if you're traveling by car or even by bus. Um, you'll put your commute expenses, which will be an automated field, tolls, hotel fees, and number of per diems. So um, hotel fees and per diems in our current version of the program, um, you have to ask for an approval before even putting it in your application. Now you can just go ahead and put it in there. You don't need an approval from me because it will go through the panel review process and there will be many people who will look at your budget. And then miscellaneous is really, you know, disposable art materials. Um, if you have any field trip admission expenses, so if you're going somewhere and there are tickets to the performance, you can add that to your budget. And then any additional expenses that maybe aren't captured in the budget itself. And so at the very end of the, your expenses line, you'll see that it'll total all of your expenses and then we'll um, 
populate what the MSAC match should be. And it will be an automated field. There are formulas in there to help you out with this. So you won't have to actually edit this doc, edit this part of the sheet. And but the one thing to of course to keep in mind is that your total expenses cannot go above five thousand. And so your income line will be your grant. So the arts and education grant, this is the projected amount you're thinking you are gonna be getting. Um, any other income, so, you know, meaning your grant match waiver, if you, if the school or the site wants to apply for one, they should ask in their budget how much more money they need. We will ask that in the application itself and in the budget. And then contributed income. So, or I'm sorry, the community art development, arts and education income. So please add, you know, if it's from Kent County or if it's from any other county, you know, how much money you're getting and where is it from? And there's another reminder here about how much um, you're allowed to have as a part of your budget. And then any contributed income, which includes cash donations or, you know, um, other income, maybe fundraisers, who knows? And then these are all automated fields. So your total income, um, cash and in kind, and then there's a field that says total income minus total expenses. It's really just to help make sure that your budget is balanced. So this is a pretty intense, but shouldn't be too intense um, budget. It, I hope it's as clear as it can be in regards to what we're asking for you guys to submit. And so application review criteria. So first, align goals and success measures. So what are your expected goals for the educational engagement? How do you define success? How will you know you were successful? And then how will your goals support your population and community's needs? So this is 250 words max. We're not asking for an essay. Um, and an excellent version of this response would be a specific, clearly stated goals of proposed activities that are closely aligned with stated success definition and measures. The stated goals highly support the selected population and community's needs. The second review criteria is your timeline. So what's your timeline of activities? So consider activities that are from planning experience, such as having an initial meeting uh, via phone, uh, a virtual conference, a site visit, to any follow-up activities. So do you have any reflection meetings? Please you know, include dates, even if they're tentative or estimates and explain the pacing of your proposed schedule. So, you know, this is a great time to talk about pacing because if you apply now, knowing that it won't happen until the spring because of COVID-19, you can say that in your application, we are planning ahead because of these things. So please be clear, specific and realistic in your timeline, demonstrating expenditure of funds, individual and collaborative planning and final implementation. Budget. So that's really just an upload of your template. <laughs> There's not too much narrative there. So how will the, M uh, the MSAC grant funding be used? Um, so the financial information is clearly tied to the proposed educational engagements and indicates realistic expenses for its implementation. And then, so this is optional. This is only if a match waiver has been included. But financial circumstance, it's a very short 250 words max narrative. So just describe the financial circumstances on why the school or the site is requesting a match waiver. So we say that, you know, an excellent answer is that the statement of need identifies a clear and substantial financial circumstance of the community and population being served. And that the statement in a need includes clear specific evidence that supports the match waiver amount requested in the application. And so this is a little bit of the review process that I'll summarize. So reviews are going to be completed monthly, once again. Um, the applications, if they are submitted by the fifth day of the month, they will be reviewed within that same month. And then any applications received afterwards will be re uh, reviewed in the following month. After a panel review, applicants and artists will be notified of their grant status by the end of the month in which we reviewed it. If you haven't been selected to receive a grant after a monthly review, um, you can request a feedback appointment with me and you can apply at any time. The grant will be considered declined if after a month and three notifications, three notifications meaning two emails and at least a phone call, the grantee 
i.e. the teaching artist, um, does not accept the award for funding. So if you get an email about approval, please, please, please sign your grant agreement as soon as possible. And so this is a little bit about our launch. So all documents, so the budget, um, guidelines, um, templates, all these things will live on msac.org and Kat will copy that into the chat box now. Um, all smart, simple applications will be live um, this week, Monday at the latest. And so you should expect an e-blast and a social media announcement um, this Monday. So if you get questions from schools, be prepared with this knowledge to, to share with them how to move forward. There will also be an Arts and Education Updates webinar during the Maryland Arts Summit, which is happening in less than two weeks. It will be a very, it will be a shortened version of this that's for the public. And we're also going to have a call for panelists um, on Monday, May 18th. So there's gonna be two panels, the Arts and Education Grant Panel, which will serve a six month term, and then teaching artists roster panelists that will serve a 12 month term and both terms can be renewed. And if you're like me, this is too many words <laughs> and this is too many letters. You, we do have some visual flow charts so you can kind of see how this grant application process goes from top to bottom. And that will be also on our website when we're ready to launch it. So let's take another reflective break. I think there were many, many questions um, and this might maybe need to be a 10 minute reflective break and we can do that too. So let's start with a couple of questions that I can answer. So there are some questions from the previous break that were related to coronavirus. I still have those things, but um, I'll go through the questions that are about educational engagement type and budget now. Yes, arts and education grant questions, that's great. Um, so just a clarification, is workshop an umbrella term or just any more detail that you can give about workshop in particular? Yeah, so we are thinking of it as an umbrella term. So anything that doesn't fit any of those other categories is a workshop. And we'll provide definitions in our glossary um, on our website. Budget questions. Uh, is it still the policy to have only one grant funded per school? So no, because a school can apply twice or more than twice, but our policy now is that they can't be funded more, they can't have more than two grants per fiscal year. It used to be one third MSAC and the school two thirds. So now it's 50 50 for the budget. So it's always been 50 50. I don't know. It's always been that MSAC um, pays up to half of the residency, but now we're calling engagements. And then the school matches that 50. Now, the other ways in which that number shifts is in regards to community art development grants. So if you want, um, you know, a community art, a, a com, I'm sorry, a county arts agency to help with the school match, they can help up to a fourth of the engagement. So that means that you owe a fourth, they owe a fourth, and then we will match the, the half. <laughs> and the, that equation lives in many, many different places. Two questions about in-kind contributions. Can it include disposable materials? And just what are some examples of what would be accepted? Sure, so disposable art materials, um, yes, it can include in-kind as well. I mean, if someone donates a bunch of supplies to you, um, that's, that's certainly fine. Uh, another version of in-kind is um, maybe for the teaching artist, maybe you guys have a consultant in your work and that person is willing to work for free, but you still wanna include that their contributions are a part of the budget <laughs> and that you're not paying them. So you can say that in your in kind. For this budget form, is it replacing the core group slash per hour worksheet Yes. Will there still be guidelines for creating a budget with the school? For example, the hourly wage, the required planning periods, et cetera. 
Sure. So yes and no. This is replacing core sessions. It's replacing the evaluation meetings because what we, our hope is that you will craft what makes the most sense for the school and for the community site you're working with. So instead of us saying you need these many sessions to make a residency or you need these many evaluation sessions, you determine if it if they're needed, you know, maybe you don't need an evaluation session, maybe you don't need pre-planning, I don't know. Um, but and and also because we're instituting a panel process to review applications, we'll be able to see the feasibility of that planning um, based on the rubric. Do we imagine the site coordinator would be filling out these budgets and forms in consultation with the artist? Yes. Yes. Um, back to a couple of engagement questions, engagement types. So if we were singing songs about the Civil War and Harriet Tubman, among others, we could do a field trip to a Civil War site or Harriet Tubman's home? You could. Mm -hmm. You can include that as a field trip. Mm -hmm. the, the only thing I would say to that is um, definitely making sure you include that in your budget. Just make sure you include it in your budget if there's any admission costs. Do you still limit poetry residencies to 40 sessions? No, it can be as many as needed. So the teaching artists are applying now instead of the site coordinators. You are both applying. So, and, and so the reason why we have the teaching artists at least start the application and have site coordinators at, um, added is so we know that you guys are collaborating on the application. Um, there's been times where we found that, you know, maybe a school starts an application and a teaching artist doesn't know about it and then they get funded <laughs> and that causes confusion. So we really just want to encourage that you guys are in full and you know constant consistent communication with your site coordinator so you are both filling out the application is the grantee the school or is the grantee the artist the grantee is the artist so this is a little bit different and this is also explained in the guidelines our matching program is pretty unique because in other matching programs, you know, the grantee would be the school and we would give the money directly to the site and they would be responsible for paying the teaching artist. We found that it's um, a lot easier for us to be the financial intermediary and for us to pay the teaching artist directly instead of you guys having to, you know, um, kind of chase two checks, one from the school, one from the site, and then one from MSAC. So you are the grantee. And just another clarifying point that the site coordinator should be in contact before we engage in all the applications. Yes, you guys should have definitely at least one conversation before you submit an application. We book over 30 performances, schools, not residencies per year that we award AIE funding. Do the schools now need to apply for that grant money or can we award it to them as we did in the past? We could also offer them up to one third of the cost and funding. I'm confused about how it happens next year. Sure, I'm, I think I would need a more clarifying point. Is this person a teaching artist or accounting arts agency? Asking this question. And Kate Graham. Yeah, I think I would need some clarifying questions because the only grant tour in this, um, the only one who is giving money is MSAC or potentially county, art, county arts agencies. So I guess I just need maybe reframing and maybe asking that question again so I can fully answer it better. If we have a show that we're doing at a local theater, same show as a, as visiting performances, but it's now at a theater, can they apply for a field trip? Say that again, Kat? 
if we have a show that we're doing at a local theater, same show as a visiting performance, can they apply for a field trip? Well, it would depend if it's separate from the performance. So this is our okay. <laughs> this is our, I'm the one who asked it. So sure. um, there's a local theater in our area this year, Black Rock, and we did family performances there. And we had a whole series, and it was the same show that people could then do a visiting performance at, but then more schools could come and they got a chance to tour the theater and got to see a live theater. And it was just a really, uh, yes. and I a ended up personally raising the money because the schools couldn't afford to come to the theater and pay the full cost. And mm -hmm. so I was like, ooh, could they apply for you know a field trip at slash visiting performance to be able to get that live theatrical experience that they don't get in a cafeteria or their school building? Great, and the answer is yes. So that would be a field trip and a performance, thank you. So I'm gonna take two more questions so we can move on. And of course, if there are more questions, there will be ample opportunity to get some more insight from me. So two more questions. Uh, we used to work with a flat fee per class session. Is that gone? As in MSAC used to set that flat fee? Yes. So there is no determining fee that we're giving you. You decide how much and you set your own fees. Could a school apply for an ensemble to teach two residencies with two different artists in our team in one year? Yes, so if the ensemble is listed on the roster as an ensemble and they're doing a residency, then that would be one, one grant. <laughs> and then if they wanted to um, apply again, I guess, for the same artist, sure they could. Um, but if maybe the ensemble in, doesn't just have residencies, but maybe they also include workshops, maybe they include field trips, maybe they include lectures, then yes, a school would apply as the ensemble, as the artist, not just the individual actors or players in the ensemble, but the ensemble itself, and then would identify um, the different engagements. And I just want to note that I do have the other questions about visiting artists from Blue Sky Puppet Theater, and we'll make sure that those can be addressed at some point. Great. So let's go on to um, a little bit about what this new website's going to look like. So the artist registry. So this is a new and improved version of our current um, kind of rosters that live on the website. So you'll be able to include your contact information. You'll be able to include a quote, a picture about yourself, um, maybe your artist statement as well. So yeah, your artist statement, you can include your website, you can include your resume, um, any arts and entertainment districts that you currently live in or that you serve, um, same as county. And then with the registry, any artist can make a profile, but not every artist will show up as an arts and education artist. So as a basically an arts and education roster artist. So what will happen is that you will just create your own account. You'll request to um, be considered for to be added as an arts and education teaching artist. And then we will make your account active as a teaching artist. So this looks pretty much the same for everybody. So you can add photos of your work. You can add videos of your work. You can add music, audio. Um, you can add written work. So if you wanted to, you know, if there's a particular pamphlet or sheet or info sheet about a particular program, you can include that as an image or as a PDF file. And so this is the thing that won't pop up unless you're turned on as a teaching artist. And we will work with you and we will have procedures set up so we can make sure that this is turned on for everyone. So booking, so you'll add your prices if you want, and this is a text field. So if it says varies, please inquire within, <laughs> you can add that. Um, your contact information, materials or technologies that are needed. Um, if you have any travel requirements or restrictions, they're up to you. 
And if you want to, you know, add any references or professional development that you can add to your profile, you can certainly do that. And then arts and education. So you will pop up as the things that you um, have been approved to do on the roster. So if you say that you can do residencies for certain grades, visiting performances for certain grades, lectures, workshops, after school weekend performances, um, online, or I'm sorry, after school weekend will turn into um, out of school time. Um, and then online programming is not on here yet, but it will pop up. And so here is how it would look like. So folks would be able to just click, you know, your residencies and they would be able to see all the different details of it. They'd be able to unclick it and they could see all the other things too. And so through all of that, you know, the point of the website is really to celebrate and to market you. So in what ways can we increase your visibility? That's one of our commitments to you, right? And so, um, this is kind of just a thought exercise that I think we can just do for a couple minutes because I know that there are a lot of questions in the queue, but I'd really love to know what type of marketing for the roster do you want to see from us? So how do you want us to support you and to heighten your visibility as a teaching artist? So we'll take five minutes to kind of just hear any thoughts folks have about that. From Sue in the chat box, we have, can we be confident that MSAC won't be biased toward lower fees? I worry about downward fee pressure. Frankie says, I would love a flyer that I can send electronically that encourage teachers slash admin to reach out and apply. Great, thank you. Um, I appreciate that comment in regards to fees because that was something that really we went back and forth on in regards to setting fees. But the reason why we ended up not suggesting a minimum or a base fee is because we are expanding the offerings on the roster. And if we were to, and because we're expanding the offerings on the roster, a hourly wage for a residency or a workshop or a lecture might change. I mean, it really depends on what the teaching artist um, decides. And so MSAC has decided that um, we want to support you in regards to if you don't know what your fee should be, we can give you support. We've also reached out to the teaching artists of the Mid-Atlantic for best practices as well, and they are a resource for you. And so I know it's hard to kind of think about, well, you know, setting a, if MSEC sets a base fee, that kind of empowers you to say, this is my price. But at the same time, we've heard the opposite where the fee is too low mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm actually not getting paid, paid what I'm worth. So, you know, it's one of those things where MSEC just wants to support you and wants to be able to say, you set what's best for you instead of us kind of negotiating that. But we can be a guide and help you set your fees if that's helpful. That's on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And then thank you for the flyer comment. Kat, if you can just make sure to note that, we'll add that. And Ariana says, to have you spread the word to the rural communities who don't know these grants exist is another way that MSAC can increase visibility. Perfect, yes, that's definitely something that's on my radar, thank you. Lenore says a five minute video demonstrating the power of the arts in the schools that county superintendents and or fine arts supervisors share with principals. Sorry, mm -hmm. it closed. That share with principals, teachers and parents. This could be shared online at faculty meetings, PTA meetings, etc. Great. Deborah mentions, um, one person performing versus more than one in terms of pricing and that some folks have more visibility and should charge more. David right. mentions, can MSAC broadcast the availability of virtual programming that's already up, running and available? 
That's a great thought. We certainly can. Yeah. Um, I will say that there, we can definitely do a better job of increasing this visibility, but there is online arts learning resources on our website. And under that um, resource, we have resources that have been created by Maryland artists and organizations. And so that's a great place for you to add what you've been working on. And also in regards to online and virtual events, um, if you have a specific virtual event um, that's maybe not necessarily always tied to learning, we have a, a sprawling document that kind of notes all that. But we can definitely include some ways we can vi uh, visualize that. So one more question before I open it up to the floor, because I know there's lots of things in the queue. Would MSAC send artists into underserved areas for demos to teacher meetings, principal meetings, conferences? Sure, so let's table that. Are there any questions in regards to marketing? Oh, it is marketing. Okay, I thought you were <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Uh, we certainly can. Um, I think um, it depends on what you guys are, are looking for in regards to how, um, how, we, how we would be able to do that, but I definitely think that's, that's possible. Yeah, I thought you were saying like, should demonstrations be an educational engagement type? Sorry, I misheard. <laughs> All right, so that was quite a lot of information and I know we might not be able to get to everybody's questions, um, but we do have about five minutes for any others that are in the queue. And please know that we'll be able, if you have any other questions, you can, there's opportunities to reach out to me. So five minutes for any other questions that are in the queue, Kat. I'll say this question before I jump back to some of the earlier ones. This is from Alan. Is MSAC establishing for the first time this new procedure as a model for other state arts councils, or are you basing this procedure on successful models from other state arts councils? Are there track records for its success from other arts councils? Thank you. So I will say that um, MSAC is really kind of leading this charge in that way. We haven't found that every state is doing an equitable funding formula. Um, this all came from the editor process. So this came from the experts that are um, your peers and our peers around the state. And to be quite honest, you know, we are doing this in a way that's totally different and brand new. We're trying to move towards a space of malleability, adaptability, and flexibility. Um, and so we're doing this for the first time. And, you know, I think there's a lot in place in saying not everything will be successful. We don't know. We, we're trying this for the first time. And we're trying this um, kind of as a, a forebear and as a, as, a, um, as a leader in this work. So I will say to that, that after a year, we will continue evaluating our processes so we can get better and we can be better. So this is jumping back to some of the residency questions and COVID-19 questions. Yep. A residency was canceled because of the coronavirus, but we got paid for it anyway. Does the school's matching funds return to the school? So if it was canceled, yes. So the school would get a refund. And MSAC has put in place that we are going to be able to um, pay on behalf of the school, pay their match basically, and pay you in full in, in if that occurs. Yeah. Do the monies provided by MSAC and young audiences disqualify us from MD PUA ends? Also, the PUA asks if we have been if we have been offered virtual work and have we denied it. I've said I would rather book the fall if I can, but I'm open to virtual if that's their choice or only options. There were two schools that were considering virtual programs for this spring. I said, OK, keep me posted. And they both pulled out. Where does this leave me with those questions? And that's from Bongo Man. Thanks. So that sounds pretty specific, and I'm I'm trying to figure out what exactly 
the, the question is, because I think there's there's context and then there's question. So if you want to reach out to me directly and we can work out um, what your next steps are, we can certainly do that. So one or two more questions before we wrap up. Is that initial conversation with a site coordinator considered the orientation session? So we are not labeling anything on what's an orientation session. So if you want to say that, you know, in your practice, what happens between before and after is a planning session or an orientation session, you certainly can say that. And then you can add that in your application saying in my timeline, you know, we met, we talked about this application and da, 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 da. So MSAC is not saying what you can and can't label as a, as a session. It's up to you. Do sites now know that site coordinators must be employees and not volunteers like PTSA presidents? Sure. So that's always been a policy, but maybe it hasn't been as clear and it is in our guidelines. So when folks, we encourage everyone to read, read and reread the guidelines before submitting an application. And that's clearly written in there. So Kat, I'm going to just close the questions. I know there's a lot more, but I really appreciate all of you guys having today. It's a lot of information and a lot of questions that were really amazing to share and to hear. So I'll say, you know, thank you again. If you have any questions, if you want to connect with me, if you want to have a sit down conversation, <laughs> you can email me. Um, I have a Calendly link so you can just book me and put me on your calendar and we can talk. And Kat is also here as a support. So um, Kat's been amazing. Thank you so much for helping me with this webinar today. She helps with all the payments. <laughs> she helps with all of the grant processing. And she's um, really also a support. So thank, thank you, you everyone. I appreciate you. Please email me. Please call me. I'm, I'm here to support and help you. So thank you. Bye all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President.